off um, just so there's less distraction and so that we have less video to interpret interrupt our um, internet access. Um, with that, I will put our first poll up. Um, if everybody could please take a minute and just answer these first couple of questions, we would really appreciate it. I'm also happy to know that there's a lot of people that are new to, uh, to these classes. We got that information from some of the responses after signing up. So we'd be, it's great to have you guys here. And for those returning. So we have a couple more minutes. Eighty two percent. We're doing pretty good. All right. I think I'm going to call it and uh, we can get the other one going at the very end. All right. I'm going to share these results with you guys just so you can see what who we have attending. And then, as Christy said, if you guys have any questions, please just enter them in the chat box because it's going to be too hard with all the information to be able to um, to try and answer them throughout the presentation. So we have a lot of information to cover and I will try and answer every question I can at the end and please email us if you do have any other questions. All right and with that I'm going to get started. So um, this is the design, design in a healthy yard is what we're gonna go through. Um, and some kind of just the four main areas that we're gonna be looking at is kind of mapping your garden, imagining your yard and garden, and then how to make a plan for that new garden that you might have, or if you want to switch something around in your garden, and then looking at how to really get those plants started off right in your landscape. There's a lot of different techniques out there, and I'm gonna try and cover as much as I can as we go through this. So the first thing that's really good to note is just mapping your garden. And this is helpful for if you move into a new house or if you have some area that might be, um, that has changed. So it's nice to get an idea of just kind of taking a, an account of what's going on in your garden um, so that you can kind of have an idea of what's happening. So stuff like soil conditions, sun exposure, aspect, wind, whatever microclimates might be around, and then also access. And I'll go into more details with all of these too. So some of the things to think about for the Northwest is what makes up our soils. And we have a very unique environment in the Northwest. We have um, multiple different types of soils that are formed because of the different environment we have from the mountains, to the different ways that the lakes and marines have formed and the Puget Sound. So glacial till, hard pan, outwash soils, lake and marine bed soils, volcanic ash, mud flows. These are all different types of environments that lead to clay soil, sandy soil, or loam. In Washington, we generally, and on the west side of Washington, we have a lot of hard pan and glacial till because of Mount Rainier. Um, and then we also have, because of Lake Washington and the sound, we have a lot of different types of lake and marine soils that actually add a lot of nutrients to the soil. And then the mud flows from when Rainier has erupted has created its own types of different soils as we've um, seen over the years. So one of the things to think about too is where is the sun? And part of that is really thinking about um, not only the different seasons. So in these pictures, you can see a summer tree versus a winter tree and how differently it can impact the yard around you and the space underneath and around it. 
um, thinking about what other types of structures might be causing shade and also thinking about as something was first grown and then as it gets larger and continues to build up how it might be changing. So planting a smaller tree, you're going to have a lot more sun in the very beginning, but as that grows, you're creating a whole different environment with that shade. And then also just thinking about from that winter to summer aspect, thinking about how an evergreen tree, for example, that doesn't lose its leaves in the winter time versus a deciduous tree and the different types of sun that it's going to be coming through. Thinking about whether or not you have a new house that has been built up next to you or whether or not you have a fence from your neighbor's yard. All of these can have different impacts on the amount of sun that is in your yard and how to think about mapping your area and also what types of plants to put into them. So like I said, some of the buildings, so especially right now with a lot of the changes that we're seeing around with new developments, there's a lot of different changes in the amount of sun and shade. And um, some of that too can change the different types of heat or um, kind of the temperature around also. Um, if you have recently cut down a tree, uh, you now are creating a much sunnier space. And so if you had shade plants there before, they can then react differently and you might have to remap that garden. The other thing thing about is um, views. So what are something specific that you're trying to look at or that you want to focus on? If you have slopes in your yard, those slopes are going to be changing the environment in your yard, um, having a wetter spot at the bottom versus a drier spot at the top. Um, so it's kind of thinking about too if it's a north versus south. So these are all different things to think about and to really take note of in your own yard as you're going through. So which way the weather? So this is kind of one of those things that we also get with our unique environment that we have here in the Northwest. Um, the prevailing winds from the Southwest or the North, um, they are going to be changing the different types of weather that we have. So in the winter time, we have the wetter type of weather um, winds coming through from the North. And then in the summer, we have the Southwest coming through, which is bringing us the drier um, weather which is then creating these different types of unique climates that we have. We also have the different mountain ranges that change the amount of rain that comes through and creates these little pockets of different types of weather, um, depending on where you are in the city or um, around the different um, lakes. So for example, up in Wallingford, which is where I am at, is a very different climate than even just Columbia City, which is only 10 miles away, just because of the different hills and the proximity to the lakes. And then think about what is exposed and what is protected. So really trying to figure out where that exposure is from which way winds might be coming through. Um, and then also reflection from sun or light covered surfaces. So the metal structure in this picture is gonna be putting a lot of reflective light off, which can then help to either increase the heat and the light in an area, which can be good for certain types of plants or can be harmful for other types of plants. So things to think about when you're planning where to plant different types of um, different shrubs or trees or plants that you have around. So thinking the other way about with the winds coming through, large deciduous trees can help to shelter houses from summer heat. And then in the winter time when it's darker because those leaves drop and it ends up helping to warm them because now they have more light coming through. Um, so thinking about that as you're planning your garden, whether or not you want to have that kind of light surface coming through. And then also looking at um, evergreen trees and them kind of actually creating more of a warmer environment. Um, in the winter time, they create little mini microclimates where underneath they're actually protecting. It's kind of like a little insulation layer that they're creating at the bottom. So it can be a little warmer spot. Um, they also will then always complete, um, they will always have a shady spot because they aren't going to lose those needles. They also, the wind doesn't go through them quite as much and so because they have that thicker type of needles, um, it's not, it's going to block some of that wind. And so you can also provide groupings of plants which is common if you look on in eastern Washington along a lot of the, the larger highways where you have farms. Um, a lot of farmers will plant 
um, windbreaks. So they'll plant a whole bunch of poplars or um, different types of trees that are full of leaves in the summertime when they actually get more winds coming through and when they have crops in there to help protect their fields. And they're also very fast growing trees. So it's another thing to think about when you're thinking about your weather, which way that wind is coming from, and then what you have on either side of it that you're maybe trying to protect or that you're trying to change the different types of environments around it. Microclimates are a really interesting thing and something that's great that you can actually adjust and change in your own yard just by planting. Um, sheltered areas are really great spots for tender plants because they generally can be more protected from the winds, the, the heavy rains, um, and even our colder weather, and even sometimes the hotter summers. Different water features actually can help warm the air, especially if there's constantly moving water. And, and then having something like brick or rock actually helps hold heat. So it's another way to create a different type of a little microclimate and being able to have specific plants around as you're planting. Providing access. This is something that I feel like people forget sometimes and it's really important for maintenance of a garden and also for really maintaining your house. One thing I think people forget about a lot of times is for utilities. So meter boxes, um, anything that the city might have to come and deal with, cable boxes, um, if you have garbage cans you're trying to move around, um, making sure that you are placing plants in a space so that they can grow to their extent and you don't have to fully maintain them to keep them into a shape or size is really important because they are going to continue to want to grow how they want to grow and you're going to be fighting them um, and ultimately they're not going to be super happy and especially if you think you might need to paint a house someday it's always good to have stuff a little bit farther away from the house so you can get to the outside of the house it's also better for the house to not have plants right up against it so thinking about that access um, also if you have hoses trying to think about where your hose connections are and then also about plants growing into a pathway um, it's common too if you have to be able to need to get access through your driveway or um, a pathway getting to and from the house. It's important to think about that when you're planting on um, the full extent of how big the plant's going to get so you don't have to try and maintain it to keep it in a certain size. Oops. So imagining your garden. So this is kind of a fun one where you can kind of just sit back and dream a little bit. Um, thinking about the different ways you use your garden. How much time and money do you really want to spend on it and what works for your neighborhood? Some different housing sites have different restrictions, so it's important to know that and stick within those. And then take advantage of the local expertise that are out there. So whether that's reaching out to us at the Garden Hotline um, or many of the other different Master Gardener programs or other plant nurseries and anybody else are really all great ways to be able to interact and think about um, looking at the different plants that are out there and any sort of advice they have. I also really like to have people go and walk around their own neighborhoods and get ideas of plants that they like also, and then looking at how they're being used in other landscapes. It's a great way to kind of continue to think about that. Um, when thinking about how you'll use your garden, are you gonna have a space where you're an avid vegetable gardener and you really want to be able to have a, garden, a vegetable garden right next door? Um, do you wanna have a big lawn where you can go and maybe play soccer in the backyard? Or do you want a low maintenance type of a garden? Thinking about these different things are very important. And then just how much money you wanna spend, are you gonna maintain it yourself? Or are you gonna have to pay somebody else to come and do it? Because it can be expensive if you have a very elaborate type of a garden. Um, so just some other things to think about. So here's some examples of just some different ways of maybe you're gonna have um, a little herb garden where you can go and pick herbs for your, gar for your kitchen. Are you gonna try and increase pollinators or do you wanna just have a little sitting space in the backyard? So different ways that you can possibly use the garden and just some things to think about as you are mapping it out and planning. When thinking about the budget for time and money, um, it's not only the installation that can be expensive with the plants, but also hardscaping if you're gonna put in a patio. Um, are you, do you need to do a lot of extra composting to build up that healthy soil? 
Do you need to add mulch afterwards? And do you already have the tools? So these are all things that are needed for doing installations. And so whether you're gonna have somebody else do it or you're gonna do it yourself. And then the continual maintenance. And that's probably one of the big ones that people don't realize necessarily is how much work it can be for some of the different types of gardens. So thinking about what types of plants you want Having perennials versus evergreens, there's a lot more maintenance in perennials sometimes because they do need some more tend and care than say a larger shrub that you can just let do its thing. Um, thinking about seasonal plantings. Are you gonna add seasonal color in the spring, summer and fall? Or are you gonna just have some different types of shrubs and trees that are just gonna kind of take care of themselves? So here's an example of taking that original map and kind of looking at how you might be able or want to kind of map out what types of garden spaces you would put into the garden. So in a space where you might have shade um, and a lot more trees for screening, it'd be a great place to encourage wildlife. Um, if you have a spot that is on the um, east side and you can put a winter garden in there. Um, also, having a really hot sunny spot is great for a vegetable garden and also lawns. So thinking about how you want to be able to have the both of those maybe or if you want to have one over the other. Dry shade is a great spot for fern gardens. Having herbs right next to a patio where you can easily get to them for cooking is always really nice. Um, compost bins, if there's a spot that's just kind of a problem area. Um, generally, you want it away from your house. You don't want them right next door. So that's kind of another good thing to think about um also as you're going through so when thinking about the zones so this is an interesting topic and it is changing a little bit as we come through the way that the climate is changing but making sure that you know the difference between the usda and the sunset zones because sunset um, magazine and sunset the gardening book which is a great book to have on hand does not use the same types of hardiness zones that the USDA does. And so they are different. So it's just important to note when you're looking at them. We are generally in 8A. Um, we're kind of fluctuate between 8B and 8A depending on where you are. Some people might be into a 7 if you're in a little bit colder area closer to the mountains. Um, and so it's really important to note that and that the USDA looks at the, um, the minimum temperature and an average on that and that's how they base their zones. Sunset takes into account more um, stuff such as moisture, um, summer heat versus winter heat or versus winter cold. So they kind of group it all together. So it's a little bit more comprehensive but it's not what you're gonna find on plant labels. So plant labels are always gonna be the USDA hardiness so it's important to note that because in the sunset zones I believe we are a four which for USDA that's eastern Washington where it gets down really really cold so they are different so it's important to take note of that. So then looking here um, so this is showing the sunset on the right and then the USDA on the left and so you can see we are an eight kind of right there all around the sound, whereas the sunset where are four um, or a five. And so those are a little bit different in the way that they describe them. Uh, but also, like I said, both very good resources to have and to note. And you can see with the USDA how drastically it changes and depending on where you are in the climate um, in the state. And it changes, like I said, because of the different mountain ranges we have, the different microclimates that come through all have an impact on what the our cold temperatures are and how they change. So the other thing to think about is grouping plants with like needs and this is really important because you don't want to mix two different types of environments into one. You're going to be fighting one, um, you're going to be overwatering one, or you're going to be underwatering the other and then you're going to have plants that are not going to be healthy and happy and they're not going to want to survive and you're going to be constantly fighting with disease or pest issues. So keeping drought tolerant plants together such as euphorbias. So in this bottom picture there's euphorbia, there's grass, there's rosemary. Um, other things to think about are like ceanothus, lavender, sea hollies, and Russian sages. These are all 
drought tolerant plants and do well with um, less water. And then also think about bug plants. So this is the polar opposite where you have blueberries, red stem dogwoods, carex, juncus, bog rosemary. These are all things that can handle a lot more water. And so if you plant them with the needs that they need, then you are better off at saving water. Um, then then also soil conditions can be similar too. So if you have an area that maybe um, is a really sandy area, you would wanna put those drought tolerant plants there. Whereas you have something where maybe it's a little bit more compact and heavy soil, sometimes the bog plants are gonna be better in those areas. So it's really important to think about that as you're also planning out your garden. Choosing low water needed plants um, are really a great way to save money and to save time. Um, it helps if you know a plant's origin, and not that you need to know all of them, but Washington natives, generally we have our wet winters and our dry summers. California and Mexico are generally dry and sunny. Um, obviously there's little pockets that are gonna be a little bit different, but as a whole, that's what you're gonna end up finding. The Mediterranean, windy and sunny, and then also has that um, kind of marine layers that come through also. And then New Zealand plants oftentimes are smaller leaved being, and helps to reduce the transpiration that comes from them. And the reason that I highlighted these four is because they're really common ones that we find in the Northwest. Um, they all adapt very well to our environment and they're some of the most common types of ones that you're gonna see in plant nurseries and in other people's yards are coming from these different regions. So some examples of Washington natives and part of the reason we like to use natives as much as possible is that they don't need the irrigation as often and they are more pest and disease resistant because they are naturally here. So some great examples for ground covers. Um, and I know also on the Bothell website, Christy put up a really great resource sheet that has a ton of different information. I definitely, if you have not already, recommend looking at those to find some more examples for any of this stuff. Ground cover, such as wild ginger and sword ferns, um, deer ferns, salau, these are all things you can find in any of the parks that are around, um, in, in any of the different areas, kind of in the lower, um, the different mountain ranges and anything like that. With shrubs, some of the really common ones that you'll see in people's yards is Oregon grape, um, red stem dogwoods, huckleberries, and the red flowering currant and rhododendrons. Those are probably gonna be the most common ones that you're gonna see. Small trees, vine maples and elderberries are gonna be really common around. And then as far as large trees, um, we have the Douglas fir, big leaf maple, western hemlock and the red, western red cedar are everywhere, which is great. And um, it's part of why we have such a, an evergreen state and on, especially on the west side is because of a lot of these different plants that we have around. With California and Mexico, these are a few of the examples, the salvia, um, which is a really common one, which is that bottom little pink flower there on the right. Um, the yuccas are the kind of long strappy types of ones that come out. Ceanothus is the top purple flower there in the middle and it's often called a California lilac. It's another name for it. Manzanita uh, is similar to our um, the madrones that we have but a smaller version of it. Carex is a type of a grass and then the fleabane is the top left hand picture, a little daisy type flower. With the Mediterranean, some of the common ones that we see and that people think of are lavender, um, which is the side there on the right. The rock rose, which is the top pink flower, um, which is more of like a shrub. Santolina, which I don't have on here, it's a little yellow flower. And then calendula in the bottom, which is very common in a lot of vegetable gardens that we see around. It's a great pollinator plant and medicinal plant too. With New Zealand, so the Libertitia, um, which I don't have a picture of on here, Euphorbia, so the bottom right hand corner, Hebe, the top right hand corner, there's um, a, both of those multiple different varieties that you'll see around and lots of different common varieties. The Formium and New Zealand flax are similar to the ones on the bottom, the long strappy type of leaves. And I would say with some of the New Zealand plants, they tend to be a little bit more sensitive um, and winter 
winter sensitive and cold sensitive than some of the other types of plants. So these are great ones to put in those little warmer protected microclimates that you might have in your yard. Since some of our colder temperatures can sometimes nick these guys. So diversity. Diversity is super important for not only providing year-round interest so that you have fall color, winter structure, spring bloom, summer bloom, fall bloom, summer fruit, winter fruit. Um, it's really important to do if you have just a perennial garden, you'll have almost nothing in the winter time. If you have um, summer blooming stuff, you won't have anything in the spring or the fall. So it's really important to have that diversity so that you have something to look at year round at your house. And it's also very important for different beneficial wildlife and different pollinators that we have around. If you think about it, all these different animals, birds, bees, bats, um, beetles, spiders, like all of them need and have different requirements for not only food, but shelter and nesting. And so it's important to have that diversity to be able to feed them throughout. And then putting edibles in your garden. Even if you are not gonna have just a full on veggie garden, you can put some of those different things like sage um, or rosemary in a garden and just kind of be worked into the garden. And make sure you just think about water when you are doing your edibles, especially if you're gonna do a vegetable garden because they do generally need more water. So think about how you're gonna irrigate those areas. And then here's just an example of providing two functions. So using an, an apple fence is what this was created. So somebody took apple trees and then did what we call a spalier and they made a, a natural fence out of it. People do that with willows oftentimes. You can also do it with dogwoods. Things that grow really quickly, are great ways to do that. So thinking about different ways to work in some of the plants that you have and get, get creative with the different types of structures that you can create. So thinking about design, this is really important with not only the diversity aspect, but thinking about height. So think about natural environments that you would see in a landscape out in the forest where you're gonna have the different height variations. You're gonna have your canopy layer, your very top layer, you're gonna have your middle layers, the shrubs, bottom layer with perennial style or smaller and then ground covers. Texture, um, having different types of textures gives interest and creates different things to look at. Mass groupings, rather than having a single plant kind of spaced out, doing a little bit of threes or a couples, um, odds and thirds, it's kind of the best way we like to think about it. It's a visually very attracting. Um, and it helps to kind of create more of an impact in your, in your garden as you're creating and designing stuff. And then having a mixture of evergreen and deciduous. Uh, it's nice to have a mixture so that you have not only that year-round interest, but it also gives you complete different textures and colors as the season goes on. It's very important to try and avoid noxious plants. Um, it's hard. Some of them have been, and a lot of them actually came over because they were landscape plants at one point and then they took over and got out of control. Um, so the bishop's weed is one of them there. It's considered a weed of concern so it's not fully on the noxious weed list yet um, as something to control but it is very important to kind of keep that in mind when you're thinking about where and how you're going to be planting. Um, so the noxious weed board is a great list to look at. There's the Washington State noxious weed list and then there's also King County weeds too. So it is different by county depending on how invasive plants have gotten. And they regulate them or they classify them in three different classes. So class A is regulated and um, must be managed by law. And so these are ones that haven't fully taken over yet and the state or the county still sees that they can maintain them and get them under control before they become a really big problem. Class B and Class C are regulated at local levels depending on um, how much they've taken over and how much they are becoming a problem. And then non-regulated noxious weeds, they're not mandated for, comp for control but recognized as a nuisance. Um, I would say that probably some of the ones that we think of the most um, are going to be in the C and the non-regulated list and that's stuff such as blackberries and ivy and holly 
um, all ones that we see everywhere. And part of why they're lower on that list is because they've gotten so out of control. And so it's really up to us as residents and homeowners to help to maintain those and to get them under control because we, the city and the state and the counties don't have enough money to be able to control all of them. So it's up to us to help with that. Um, King County weeds of concern, like I said, not regulated, but they're on list to be kind of recognized as being problematic and to kind of just keep an eye out for. Every year this list does adjust a little bit and if you have a plant that you think is starting to get out of control you can actually nominate it to go on the list and they do have some really good maps on how to track some of the class A weeds and so if you do see something like the garlic mustard it's important to notify them because they want to get it under control before it's too late and starts to take control. So starting your plants off right. So this is important because um, I like to think of healthy soil as being the immune system of your plants and of your garden. Um, if we don't have healthy soil, then we really are going to have plants that are going to be struggling all the time. Um, so it's really important to think about that. And then also just how to properly plant. Um, it's kind of surprising how much I've seen plants not being planted correctly and how much it can have an impact later on down the road. There was a time when I dug up a plant, a tree that had been in the ground for maybe 20 years and it still looked like it was in the pot, even though the pot wasn't there. I've also seen trees planted with the pot in the ground. So they never took it out of the pot when they planted it. So stuff like that's very important. Um, mulching your plants and then establishing drought tolerance. We'll go into a little bit more of all of this too. So when thinking about soil, um, we don't like to call it dirt because um, the dirt is only a little part of what actually makes up soil. Um, when you think of soil, there's different mineral particles that are different sizes. So sand is going to be our largest and then silt being second and then clay. And so these are all kind of different aspects that are com com um, part of the garden soil that we have outside. They all need air and water, um, which is kind of pore space. So it's part of why we have a combination of sand, silt, and clay in a lot of our garden soils that we want to use. And then organic matter and soil life. And so these are kind of what fit in between everything and what creates, what really makes soil to be soil and to be the living component that is necessary for healthy plants to be able to grow. And so good soil is about half mineral, half pore space, and then a much smaller but very essential amount of that organic matter. And so that organic matter in soil life is gonna be your microorganisms, your bacteria, your worms, um, and even beneficial nematodes, you're gonna have all this stuff is gonna be in there and that's helping to bring it all together and to make it that living, living part. Loam is what we like to call just a mix of sand, silt, clay, um, and just the nature of it all coming together. So we have generally for something like a vegetable garden, we say sandy loam is probably one of the best you can have. And that's having those different um, percentages of each of these. If you haven't before, I recommend just going out and grabbing a handful of your own soil and just rubbing it between your fingers and feeling what that soil feels like to see if you can tell if it's a lot more sand, silt, or clay. Which actually, before I go on, so the other thing to think about is when you're thinking about these is with the sand, thinking about how water goes through. Um, and so if you have a higher sand component in your soil, you're going to have a lot, you're going to have to be watering a lot more often. Whereas if you have more silt or clay, it's not going to hold on, it's going to hold on to that water moisture a lot more when you're watering and in the winter time it's going to be a lot heavier but in the summer time it also dries out um, because of those smaller particles. So just another thing to think about. So when I was mentioning the correct planting techniques, so this is important for multiple different reasons. Um, there's a lot of different things that have happened over the years 
but people not quite realizing the correct way to plant something and can have problems down the road. Um, so for trees and shrubs, you really don't wanna be amending that soil with stuff like compost. Um, it's really not a good idea to do. And if you are going to be doing that, you wanna amend the entire planting area, not just the hole that you're putting that tree or that shrub in. And what happens is if you do end up doing that is they're in this perfect little environment with those roots. And then when they get out to the native soil, they stop and it's almost like they're in another pot again. And so it's really important to not amend that soil. Um, looking at the size of the hole. So this is very important with shrubs and trees. You always wanna dig just as deep as that root ball is or how it was planted in the pot. And then you wanna do about two times as wide. So give it nice space and you dig it all out, but you wanna use that native soil. And you wanna make sure that when you are planting that you're not covering up where the trunk meets that root base. So you don't ever wanna cover that part up because that can cause rotting on the stem or the trunk. And then girdling of roots. And this is one that I think a lot of people don't think about or realize is that when you pull a plant out of the pot, oftentimes those roots can be really root bound. And so it's really important to look at how those roots are forming. If they're starting to form in a circle around the pot, just gently take your hands, take a knife even, and just kind of break those roots up a little bit so that they know that they can go out and not keep going in a circle. With perennials, you same thing, kind of loosen up that root ball a little bit. Um, perennials, you can amend with compost a little bit, but you still don't necessarily need to unless you have really, really compact, icky soil. Um, and then vegetables, you're really going to be planting those um, just as they are in their pot. You always want to loosen up the root balls in any plants that you're putting in the ground. And then also a lot of times because vegetables, most annual vegetables only have one season to grow, adding that compost and fertilizing immediately is usually a good idea to help them get a jump start. Um, with lawns, you're preparing the soil by really kind of mixing in some compost. And this is if you're starting a new, a new lawn, you really don't want to compact that soil as much as possible. So try not to walk on it as much as possible. And then staggering of the ends is if you're laying down sod. You don't ever want to put your sod down so that all of the ends are meeting the same middle spot. You want to stagger them um, so that they go one goes in farther than the other and it goes over. And then fertilizing with honestly just a, about a quarter inch of compost on top of a brand new lawn um, or on top of an established lawn is really a great way to add a, a little bit of just natural fertilizer to help build that soil. So when thinking about mulch, this is probably one of the best things and anytime you don't ever wanna have bare soil in your yard if you can help it. Um, it's really important for helping to conserve moisture, especially in our dry summers. It really helps you don't have to worry about trying to water as often. It helps actually with moderating the soil temperature. So keeping it cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. And it's excellent for keeping weeds down. Um, so there's multiple different types of mulch. and It's important to know which ones to use for what area. So wood chips, generally perennials, trees, shrub beds, um, around ground covers and pathways are all gonna be the best ones to use. Uh, a lot of times, so you can see on the far left, that's something similar to like arborist chips, which is just the little bits that are left over from an arborist going out and cutting down a tree and running it through. So you're gonna get leaves, you're gonna get wood, and you're gonna get the bark all mixed together. It's a great way to add nutrients to the different tree and shrub beds or to use as pathways. Compost is really good for vegetable gardens and annual beds. I use compost in shrub and tree beds, um, sometimes just around the base of a tree in a shrub and then would put wood chips on top if I think that the area needs a little bit more nutrients added in. Leaves are excellent everywhere. And I think is probably one of the best things you can do because they're free, because we have lots of trees in Seattle and the different cities. You probably don't wanna collect them from a street so that you don't have any sort of contamination from the cars, um, any sort of oil or gas or anything that's coming through. 
but rake them up off your lawn and just put a really thick layer around your trees, your shrubs, and your vegetable beds. Um, as they break down, they'll create a leaf kind of mold, which actually is excellent in decomposing and adding really good nutrients and mycorrhizae back into that soil. So it's a great kind of free mulch to put in. Um, and you can also save them for later, which is great too for um, kind of holding on to and just put them in a bag and keep them dry. Straw is great for veggie gardens and perennials. You want to make sure you get organic straw because oftentimes straw is um, and hay can be sprayed with different types of chemicals in the farms and they have weed prevention in that chemical and so if you put it on your veggie garden and it's not organic you risk having um, issues with germination from any seeds from the different chemicals so make sure you get organic if you can different commercial mixes so different types of manures compost word products um, they're all over there's so many different kinds and it can be very confusing um, but any of the manures you get in a store from a garden store or say like a hardware store are gonna be composted down. Um, and so just looking at the different options and what's gonna be best for you and for the size of an area that you have, whether you need to have a bulk big load coming through or if you just have a couple of bags that you need to get. And then gravel is really the best thing is gonna be for paths. Um, you don't ever really wanna put that in your garden. Uh, it's not good to kind of mix in to have more gravel kind of worked in. So planting in the fall is one of the best times to do any sort of trees and shrubs. Um, and also it helps really because it's in, there's still enough warmth in the ground for plants to be able to have root growth. But with the rains coming, you don't have to water as often and because the sun and the heat isn't as intense like it is in the summertime, it's less stressful in the plants. And so the plants can focus on roots and not on trying to shut down and protect themselves from transpiration through the summertime. It's a great time if you want to have any sort of spring bulbs. Um, we plant spring bulbs in the fall because they need to go through a cold spell to be able to initiate their flowering. So daffodils, tulips, um, crocus are all good things to plant now. And then it's also just comfortable working temperatures. It's nice because it's not too hot um, and we haven't, don't get our rains too much in for another month. So it's a great time to get out and plant different types of shrubs and trees and also some of the perennials too. So winter soil temperatures, this is an interesting website, um, which if it's not on the resource list, I'll try and get it. Um, out there for you guys. It's great to know for um, a lot of different reasons. I use it probably most often for starting my vegetable garden in the spring because a lot of seeds do not actually start. They won't germinate in very cool temperatures. So it's nice to know what the different temperatures are. We really don't get too much into some of the cooler weathers um, as you can see like on the east side of the state as much. Um, so this is from September of 2016 is these examples. And you can still see it's almost still in the 60s out there um, around. So we still, even being around this time of the year, the soil temperature is actually still pretty good. Um, it's when it starts to get a little bit cooler, um, that we start to get down into the 30s. And it's just, it's too hard for plants at that point to do much. So winter rains, um, like I said, fall and winter, you don't have to water as often, which is great. Um, and you can see here, we really, June, July, August, and even September, we really just don't get that much rain. And most of our rain ends up coming November through January and February, depending on what year we get. Um, I've seen, I think in the last four or five years that it's kind of starting from May through September. So, our kind of drought time is starting to extend a little bit. And without having our June rains, um, which is really important for a lot of our evergreen trees and evergreen shrubs to kind of get one last big boost of water before going into the hot summer, um, we're starting to see some more issues with our evergreen trees because of that. So it really helps to kind of get that, recharge the soil um, to help the plants get through our hotter, 
and driest July and August, um, and then even into September. So just something to think about, um, even for stuff that you, that are drought tolerant, even like trees that are fully established or shrubs that are established, you still might need to water in July and August because our water levels drop so much throughout the soil. Um, we just don't have that amount of water to be able to get them through sometimes. So it's just something to think about and take note of. So plants and stress. So making sure they're always in the right place. Um, like I said, the cooler temperatures really help a lot when you're planting. Adding that mulch as soon as you've planted really helps a lot to help protect them. Um, and then just making sure that you're putting them in the right place because that is going to be one of the biggest things that you don't have to keep fighting them and they're not going to keep fighting you. Um, and then just thinking about water management and really making sure you plan the right type of size, the, the mature height and width of a plant is really important to look at because you don't want to have to keep them growing on top of each other and fighting each other. Um, it's less pruning if you do it that way. It's also less stress on the plant or any sort of disease and pest management too. So the last kind of section here is thinking about watering. And so this is really important because oftentimes, like I said, even in our summers, we still need to water a little bit because we do have an actually a pretty dry summer. Um, newly planted shrubs and trees can honestly take up to two years and sometimes even more to become established. So even if you have something like a rosemary or lavender that is a drought tolerant plant, it can still take a year for it to fully become established. So don't expect to not be able to water. Um, and then think about the different types of systems that you can choose from. So depending on what type of garden you have or how big of a space, are you going to be able to put in an automatic irrigation system so that you don't have to think about it so often? They can be more expensive. Um, they can be good for different areas where you have different zones and you can adjust them. It's because a lawn is going to need more water than your tree section or your shrub section. Um, your vegetable garden is going to need more water than your tree section. So think about that with zones. You can set them up to do that. Drip irrigation is great for, um, I like it for vegetable gardens and then also for some shrub beds or perennial beds where you can have the hoses come out and go to specific areas within, within your beds. You can also install them pretty easily yourself. There's a lot of kits that you can buy from different stores um, and can just hook up right to your, your spigot. Soaker hoses are oftentimes used, um, I use them in brand new plantings um, and bury them under the mulch and it's a great way to get stuff established um, and just hook them up to either timer or you can hand turn them on. I also use them in vegetable beds too. So they're great for kind of those linear rows that you might be doing. Hand watering, oftentimes I end up having to do for pots um, or if I have some plants that just need a little extra water, I'll have to go out and do some hand watering. So then thinking about, do you need something like a watering can or just a, a, um, a hose nozzle to go on the end? And then rain collection systems. There's a lot of different great types of systems out there, um, cisterns and rain barrels. Rain barrels are much smaller and only 50 to 100 gallons, whereas cisterns are gonna be 200 to thousands of gallons depending on a space. Um, they're really excellent for collecting rainwater off of your roofs in the winter time to be able to save and use for the summertime. It's also very important because we do have so much rain that comes down in the winter time that it can help to reduce the amount of stormwater runoff that happens. Um, and so you're doing multiple different kind of techniques there by kind of saving some money on paying for water and then also protecting the oceans or the sound and the lakes and the rivers that we have around too. So rain gardens is another kind of way that you can do kind of rain collecting. Um, and so rather than being able to use the water from a rain garden, you're collecting it and it's actually helping to slowly absorb and filter storm water. So 
generally what you'll end up doing is taking your um, downspout and connecting it down into a rain garden, which has a special type of soil that has been planted in with special types of plants that are able to handle um, a little bit more water at the very bottom and then drier up at the very top. So you make kind of a divot in the soil. And so what this does is it really, it helps to, like I said, it slows down the amount of water that comes through. And so that more of it is able to be absorbed into the ground rather than just run straight off. Um, and it helps to actually filter out some of the different um, stuff that might be coming off the roof um, or even what might be going down the roads. And then there's this site, the Rain Garden Handbook. Um, so this has a lot of good information on the different types of gardens that you can create. Um, and it gives you a really great comprehensive list of all the different types of plants that you can plant and also shows you how to create rain gardens um, for your own backyard. And then also just how to maintain them, which is a great thing to be able to just kind of have in, in your back pocket. And then lastly, um, this is kind of just a smaller resource page. So our garden, garden hotline phone number and our website. Um, we also have email, which is just help at gardenhotline.org. Tilt Alliance is our main kind of overarching company that manages us. And then Cascade Water Alliance, Puget Sound starts here. And then the City of Bothell website, which um, this link is the one that would take you to the resource page for um, all of the other extra resources that were mentioned or just even more so. Um, and then lastly, just if you haven't already, we are having another one of these sessions that goes into more putting your garden to bed next Wednesday, um, same time from seven to 8.30. And with that, the end of the slideshow. Thank you very much, Selena. If you're able, can you keep that last slide yes. up I was for just a minute while up. I go over uh, how the Q&A session will work? Yes. Okay, thank you. That was a ton of information. <laughs> I know we had to move through it very quickly, um, but I know. you did an Thanks excellent so job, and thank you. thank you. We will post a link to the slides from this presentation on our website. We'll have that up by the end of the week and I'll email it to everyone that participated tonight, as well as if the recording actually worked, we'll also include that on the resource page. So now we are ready to begin the Q&A session, which is scheduled until 8.30. So if you haven't already had a chance, uh, please do type your questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many of them as we can. We already have a few to start with. And you're also welcome to turn on your video if you like. Sometimes it's nice to be able to see people face to face. Um, but we ask that you do please stay muted unless we do need some clarification on your question. And just a reminder, if time does run out and we're not able to get to your question, you have a link to the Garden Hotlines website in the email that I sent you earlier today where you can ask your questions online or by phone. So let me get started with the questions we have. I'm just going to ask them in the order that they came in. Give me just a second. Okay, so someone asked, if I have a holly tree, should I remove it? <laughs> um, so that's actually, I was participating in noxious weed class today and we talked about holly trees. Um, they are a noxious weed and they are, they're a troublesome plant because they spread very easily. Um, and so if it's something that you don't care too much about, I would say yes. Um, but also trying to manage the, they can be really large, so I can understand why it might be difficult to remove. So just trying to maintain and keep an eye on the fruit that falls and when it's flowering and trying to reduce the amount of um, it potentially spreading. Um, they are pretty, the birds do eat the berries, but um, we are trying to keep them from spreading as much as possible. So I wouldn't say there's like a real good, like, yes, you should definitely do it. Um, so I, it's a kind of a case by case situation with them. Um, if I had a very large one in my yard, I probably 
wouldn't remove it unless I had a real plan for what to put in its place. Um, but I have removed smaller ones because um, we did not want to have to deal with them spreading plants. They are hard to, to remove. You need to actually stump grind them out. So just cutting them down is not gonna kill them. So it's the other thing to think about. Okay, and we had a question about, do you know of any way to control shot weed? I looked on the King County noxious weed web or their weed list, but couldn't really find anything specifically about shot weed. Um, I mean, the big thing with shot weed is getting it before it blooms because it does spread by seed very quickly. Um, trying to pull up as much as possible before it goes to seed. And then their seeds do live in the soil for a long period of time. Um, so honestly, if you keep up with them, um, you can control it. It does take some time. Probably the one of the best things to do is to actually in the springtime when they start to sprout up, um, pulling as much of the big ones as you can, and then just roughing up the soil where they're at will help expose the dormant seeds that are underneath and cause them to re-sprout. If you do that a couple of times um, and then put a good layer of mulch down afterwards, another one of those reasons to never leave soil bare, um, that can help a lot. They are one of the easier ones to get rid of. You just have to keep up on them a little bit. Next question, are there watch outs to look for when you get mulch delivered to your house? I've heard people say they got unwanted material in their deliveries. So I guess kind of what's the quality control with, with mulch? Yeah. So there's a couple of plants that we tell people to try not to get. Um, black walnut is gonna be one because it actually has a chemical in it that will inhibit growth. And so it'll keep your plants from growing. Um, I try to not get any sort of laurel in because it spreads similar to say holly. Um, other than that, I wouldn't worry too, too much about some of the different things. Oftentimes, I mean, that is something that you risk having um, with companies like, um, um, I'm totally going to space on it now. Um, Chip drop. What was that? Chip drop? Yes, so, thank you. Okay. <laughs> it's like I'm just based on the name. <laughs> Chip drop. Um, you can ask them to not have certain types of crops like plants in it. Um, it's not ever going to be a hundred percent guarantee. I have used it for years and never had a problem. Um, I would say if you just kind of be aware of where you're going to put it. So if you're going to put it in, say, your vegetable garden, um, I mean, you wouldn't want to put chips like that in your vegetable garden. But if you have it somewhere where you're concerned, um, maybe use it for just a pathway um, for that and then get something where you have more control over. Um, so rather than from an arborist, getting something from um, like an actual bulk yard or that's in a bag because that is better regulated than say it's just from an arborist. But yeah, black walnut's probably the biggest one um, to be concerned about. Is there a list of plants that can be planted in the fall and will survive in the winter? I thought it was just bulbs that could be planted in the fall. Um, honestly, I would say most trees and shrubs you could actually plant in the fall. Um, and I mean, you don't wanna, if you have stuff, let's see, I would probably not plant too much later than like the beginning of November, just because we start to get into those cold, colder temperatures. You want plants to get a little bit established before they go into winter. Um, if you don't think you can get them in ground, um, just mulch around the pot to help protect that pot um, or wait until the spring to do it. Any sort of kind of more sensitive types of plants you might not want to do, but I would say most of the different types of plants we have, um, even perennials are gonna be fine right now. Um, the ones that you wouldn't want to do is like some of the different vegetables. I mean, obviously there's some that you couldn't put in right now. We're getting pretty close to the end of our vegetable planting season. So that would be probably the biggest ones. Um, there's not just a list that I can think of for fall planting. Um, if you had specific ones you were curious about, you could always email us and we can let you know if they're ones that you should be concerned about or not. Okay, spiders. Is too many spiders a problem? I have four to five big ones in the front and about the same number in the backyard. 
They build cobwebs around the plants. Is, will this be okay? Yeah, so spiders um, are great. You should always keep spiders as much as possible. Um, I do remove them out of my house, but um, this time of the year, you're gonna start seeing them a lot more. And I, honestly, when they're around your plants, they're actually eating whatever bad bugs are around. And they're also a food source for birds. So unless, the nice thing is that we don't have too many poisonous or dangerous ones on the west side of the state. So you don't have to worry about that quite so much. Most of what you're going to be seeing building those bigger webs are just garden spiders and they aren't actually going to hurt you um, unless you have a sensitivity to them. But most people, it would just be kind of be like a little uh, mosquito bite if they do end up doing anything to you. So they're not going to hurt you and they're actually doing a lot of good in the garden. So unless it's in your house or in your face, um, I would say they're probably okay to leave. I sheet mulched my backyard a couple months ago and the spiders are loving the wood mm -hmm. chips. <laughs> yeah. All the little bugs that are coming out. Yeah, yeah. this time of year you're going to start seeing a lot more of them. Um, but yeah, they're, uh, they're good to have around. We like to encourage them as much as possible. Question about a hydrangea that's getting too much sun. Mm -hmm. If the person wants to move the hydrangea to a new location, what's the best time of year to do that? Um, so you could do it now, um, or you could wait until spring. So those are kind of, when you're doing transplanting, those are the two best times to do it. Uh, you want to kind of get as much of that root ball as possible. Um, with hydrangeas, sometimes they can be really big and the root balls can be kind of large. So one thing that can be easier to move them um, is to actually get a tarp and lay it down next to the plant as you're digging it up. And so you dig your hole and then you can kind of slide the tarp underneath it and kind of make like a little scoop to be able to move it. It'll be a lot easier for you to move rather than trying to pick it up and move it. And you can risk breaking a lot of the roots and um, the, the soil off the plant. And always water it in really, really well after you've done that. Um, another thing that can help with transplant because you are shocking that plant by cutting all their roots off when you move them is you can actually fertilize them with something that's either higher in phosphorus or um, B12 is a type of a nutrient that encourages root growth and helps with transplant shock. So those are two that I would recommend. Next question, is there a big difference between using raised garden beds versus amending the soil directly? How would I know which approach to take? Um, so, a couple of different things that are good to take into consideration. Um, if you are in an area where you potentially have contaminated soil, so if you live within like the smelter plume of um, the Tacoma smelter plume, which doesn't go up, it goes to South King County. Um, so let's say like SeaTac um, and kind of South. So if you're North, you wouldn't have to worry about it necessarily. Um, if you have arson or lead that's been like lead paint on your house, something to think about. Um, if you have really, really clay or rocky soil, that's going to be really hard to amend. Um, that would be another reason to do it. Um, sometimes it's easier for accessibility to build a raised bed because you don't have to lean over quite so much. Um, so all those are things to take into consideration. Uh, we've created a lot of different wood beds by using juniper. Um, and so it's a sustainably sourced type of material from trees that are in Oregon that are not native and are actually taking over the forest. So they're harvested and then um, they also have similar water wicking capacity that cedar does. So you don't have to worry about it rotting so quickly. And then you can get that perfect kind of combination of soil from any of the bulk yards um, to be able to fill those up. So I oftentimes will do raised bed for, um, for my plants because it's, I have the space to do it and it makes it easier so I don't have to bend down so far to do my beds. Um, but I've done both. I've planted in the ground um, and I've done the raised beds too. So. I would definitely say if you have a contamination issue, then that's definitely number one. Um, and you can get your soil tested um, to see what's going on with that too. We have a question also related to raised beds. Is pressure treated wood safe to use in a garden that will have some vegetables? No, 
um, <laughs> yeah, if, if you can do stay away from pressure treated wood as much as possible, um, it will leach into your soil and can cause problems. Um, if you are going to use any sort of pressure treated wood, line it with, um, I've, I've had people line it with pond liner before actually, because it is a food grade type of material that will help to keep that out. Um, a lot of, for a very long time, they used um, railroad ties to create different beds. And that was a big problem that unfortunately people didn't know um, because it would keep them from rotting. But yeah, if you're gonna try and do, if you do have some pressure treated wood already, try and line it. Um, if you haven't built yet, look at either untreated cedar or juniper. Um, or even they have some um, different types of plastics that don't leach that you can use um, for kind of a manufactured type of wood. And then lastly, you could also do the metal feeding troughs. Um, galvanized troughs work really well. You just need to put holes in the bottom of them for drainage. Sort of another contamination related question mm -hmm. here. Is rain barrel water acceptable for a vegetable garden? Are there any issues with chemicals from the roof? Um, so there is a couple of different studies that have been done out there. Um, there, if you have, first off, if you have just like regular, like a regular um, piles on your roof, you don't need to worry about it so much. The one thing to think about is um, any sort of kind of bacteria that can build up from like bird droppings or squirrels running around or rats running around. Um, generally, we just say flush. You don't want to drink it. Um, because of that. Um, water that's usually is the only things that they have shown in this study and I cannot remember I think it's safe. I'll have to look it up um, and I can maybe send it out to people. Um, they did a test of 15 different types of materials on a roof and found that there was not enough build up to be harmful. And so they gave a green light saying that it is okay to use on your vegetable gardens. Um, the one thing that can happen is if you end up having some sort of stuff sprayed on for moss control, um, that can harm aquatic animals. And so if you live near a lake or a water source, that's actually one that they are more concerned about is that impacting different animals. And oftentimes it's in excess of, it's copper that's in it that can have a huge impact on aquatic um, ecosystems. So if you're concerned about any sort of um, like bacteria or anything like that, water the soil and not on the plants, wash your plants really well. The plants aren't gonna uptake that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, it is safe and it's Sightline is the name of the organization that did the research, just remembered. So yeah, look up Sightline and um, rainwater harvesting for edible gardens. You'll be able to find it. We have two more questions in the chat box, but we do still have about 12 minutes. So if anyone else has questions they want to ask, um, please feel free. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is, the wood chips you showed look much thinner. I have some quite thick wood chip mulch. Is that the same thing? Um, it's probably, I mean, it's different types of grinders that people are using. Um, so sometimes they're, you'll see more shredded from arborists will be kind of thin and shredded. Um, if you get bags of stuff, oftentimes you'll see like the big wood chunks and what we call play chips. Um, play chips generally I would say are great for pathways um, and even for some type of shrub and um, like tree beds. Um, what I like about the arborist trips or more of the shredded is that they break down a little bit faster and so they're helping to encourage beneficial organisms and also mycorrhizae from starting to form. So you can still use the thicker wood chips um, that helps with not blowing away. So I just kind of I would think about kind of the specific location you're putting them um, and whether or not it would be a good spot for them. But yeah, you can still use them and they're perfectly good to use. What are good replacements to grass around here? I eventually want to remove a lot of grass in my front yard, but am unsure on what to replace it with. Um, there is a lot of really great grass alternatives. I think you could do a whole class on this. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Um, yeah, there's a lot of really great grass alternatives. Um, they've been coming up with a lot of different ones, specifically helping with like pollinators. So there's some different types of clovers that stay short. There's little daisies that stay short um, and they're creating like lawn mixes that you can um, put together. Florida lawn is one specifically that does a lot of blooming. What's nice with the different flowers like those is they stay really short and so you can still mow them um, and keep them nice and short, but you don't have to, they're not gonna be creating the same type of um, problem with the lawns that with how much water they need and all of that. Um, PT Lawn Seed down in Portland has a really great list of a whole bunch of different types of options for replacing lawns. Uh, I've seen people do um, different types of mosses and encouraging mosses to put in. There's a lot of different ground covers. If you go to steppables.com, they have a lot of different types of ground covers that you can put that can also be used instead of actual lawn. Okay, I've got one more question in here. Should plants be mulched in the fall? And what about veggie beds? Should they be mulched? And then another question, three, three part, can <laughs> cement blocks be used for raised, for raised beds? Um, so first off, cement blocks, yes, they can be used for raised beds. I've done that a lot, actually. It's a great way to kind of reuse that resource. Um, they'll actually hold heat. The one thing to think about with them is concrete does absorb moisture. So those edges are gonna be a little bit drier. So just think about that when you're planning, you're watering and looking at that. Um, yes, mulching in the fall is a great time to do it. Um, it helps with kind of keeping those weeds at bay and you don't ever wanna have that bare soil because a lot of nutrients can get washed away from our rains. And so it helps to protect that soil from compaction. Um, and then, like I said, the weeds and also adding nutrients and helping to moderate that soil temperature when we do start to get our um, colder times in December and January. And vegetable gardens, same thing. Put leaves on, put straw on. If you have burlap, put burlap on top. Fall kind of from now until middle of October is a great time to plant cover crop seed. Um, if you want that for your vegetable garden, uh, you can find that in most of the garden stores um, and it's just a combination of different annual um, either cereal grains or different legumes that you can put in to help protect that soil um, so just another way to be able to to protect that soil and help to build that healthy soil while you're not having it, like an intense garden happening in it well that is all we have in the chat box right now so we do want to ask if you can please answer a couple more questions. Just take one more poll before we end the workshop tonight. And if you do, you will be entered into that drawing for either a gardening book or the grand prize. Of, you can have up to an hour and a half of an online consultation with one of Tilt's um, experts, which that will give you just invaluable information. So, um, Selena, are you, you able to launch that uh, yeah, poll? Yeah, I can. All right. If anyone has any remaining questions they want to enter into the chat, um, now's your shot. I want to thank all of you for giving up your evening to join us. And Selena, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, are you hosting next week's workshop? Me? Yeah. As well, yes, yeah. you are. Okay, great. Be great. Yep. Fantastic. So we'll give you all a couple minutes to fill out that poll and then as soon as you're done, uh, feel free to sign off or if you can think of any other last minute questions, um, we'll stay on here till 8.30. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull up that Sightline article. Okay. Yeah, and if you have any other resources you wanna send send my way that I can add to the web page. Um, I'll be working yeah. on it tomorrow. Okay. Okay, we have another question. There is, I believe, a berry bush of some sort that lives underneath the fence between my fence and my neighbors that grows rapidly, but I can only cut it back as I think it exists mostly on their side. What is the best way to deal with this? Um, I think we all have that neighbor. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think besides you just cutting it back, um, there's not a lot you can do if most of it is on their side. If you want, you can take a picture of it and send it to us at help at garnhotline.org and we can help identify it. Um, and that might be able to help kind of give you some more advice on how to manage it um, if we know what it is exactly. Um, yeah, it's one of the hardest things with neighbors is having their plants encroaching onto your property, especially if you have weeds that are coming over. Um, become friends with your neighbors and ask them if they can move it, um, which doesn't always happen, but it is one thing that you can try and do too. Um, I would say that probably one of the most common ones I hear about are blackberries or morning glory. Um, as being some of the two worst ones that people are dealing with with their neighbors, unfortunately. I have a neighbor with morning glory, and I've never seen this neighbor, but I've lived mm -hmm. here for a year. I know there's someone there, but I'm kind of thinking about sending over a welfare check or something. But yeah, the, <laughs> the morning glory, every month we go out there and we pull it out because it just keeps creeping back under the fence. Yep. Yeah. No, it's a... Uh, it's frustrating, it's hard, um, but yeah, it's just kind of with some of that sort of stuff. I mean, there's, if it's coming up from the roots, that's a different type of a problem than if it's just like the branches coming over. The uh, runners, yep. Yeah, branches are easier to maintain than the roots coming under. So um, if it's branches, you might be able to put up another fence or something. If it's the roots, you're gonna have to dig down and actually put a barrier in the ground <laughs> for that which is not fun, so. All right. Oh, let's hold oh, on one, one second. Uh, here's a question. I do not use chemicals in my yard and have morning glory, but my neighbor does. Are there things I should consider in terms of plantings near the fence? Um. I would definitely be careful about anything, any sort of ground covers, because you're going to have a much harder time trying to get it out of ground covers than you would, say, shrubs or trees. Uh, the one interesting thing with Morning Glory is that it does, um, the roots only kind of live in the top six to eight inches of the soil. And so a trick that you can do with helping to control it is to actually put, say, I don't know, cardboard or a tarp or really, really thick mulch down on the top and the roots will actually come up to that surface because they live where they can still get some light um, and they'll come up and then you can pull that back and you can get a whole bunch of them out at once if you do end up having a problem. So hence why it's easier to manage if you have shrubs or trees versus a ground cover where you're having to kind of pull out the stuff. Um, there's not, I, I mean, even if, there's not really any good chemicals for it anyways. Um, it is a really big problem and they're looking into some sort of types of um, biocontrols with different insects that potentially can eat it and kill it. Um, they're still looking into research for that. So, um, but yeah, that's probably the best thing is just kind of not putting something that is gonna be harder to kind of weed around because you probably will have it come through at some point, um, just because the nature of the plant. And there was one person who asked about dealing with moles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I always tell people this, and it's not always their favorite answer, but um, moles mean you have good soil. You have good microbes and worms in your soil. Um, but as far as dealing with them, um, there's not really been any good 100% ways to deal with it. There's a lot of different techniques that people try and that seem to help. Um, one technique is taking mineral oil and putting it down the hole because it, for some reason, they don't like that. Um, they don't like strong smells. So mint or rosemary, um, any of the sages, really strong smells, blending it in a blender with like hot water and then pouring that down will make them go away. Um, they generally kind of come like cycle through. So they'll, um, 
like one year you might have them really bad and the next year you won't have them as much. They generally don't eat the roots of plants. They're just going out of after worms and different bugs. Um, so you don't have to generally worry about them trying to eat or harm your plants. The one thing they can do is they'll create air pockets around and then water won't get to the roots. So just stomping down those air or their mounds can help. Um, my dad puts cat poop down it down the holes to make them go away. So there's all sorts of different techniques that people have tried. Um, people have flooded them out. Um, I don't know if that's the most humane thing to do, um, but yeah, I would say those are some of the different techniques that I've, I've read and heard about people trying to do. And then if we can sneak in one last question. Yes. Do you, what are your favorite flowers to grow here that the rabbits don't eat? Mm. <laughs> Um, rabbits, I feel like they eat everything. Um, let's see. Um, they're not going to go after things like lavender and rosemary, um, as much. I haven't seen them going after that. They usually like more tender types of plants and usually when they're really small. Um, so if you can kind of, I've seen people that will put like the kind of, um, bird netting because it's really thin you can barely see it and they'll put that around a plant um, and even though they jump they actually don't jump that high so if you just put a fence that's about a foot to a foot and a half tall they're generally not going to get over that so just doing that little tiny bit of a barrier until the plant gets big enough sometimes will help too. Um, I've also at least with a lot of different rodents you can take cayenne pepper and mix it in a spray bottle with water um, with a couple of drops of dish soap and spray that on your plants and they don't like the spicy. So you can try that too. Um, and that's also seemed to help a little bit. So dish soap and cayenne pepper seem like a good note to end on. <laughs> again, thank you all for joining us. Um, if I'm not, if I'm not able to get our web pages totally updated by the end of tomorrow, then you should Expect an email from me on Friday with, we'll have everything updated and links to the presentation and recording um, av available for you then. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Christy, do you want to stay on and chat or do you want to?